Um, and now it is my pleasure to welcome you back and to introduce to you your moderator for this afternoon's session, Rebuilding Society After Violent Conflict, Susan Marash Minerly. Good afternoon, Mahaba. Um, it is indeed my pleasure to sit here with these artists from the conference so far. Um, I am so in awe of the work um, and of all of the artists who are represented here and the courage that it takes for these artists to do what they do. Um, I know you don't really want to hear me talk. I want to listen to them talk also. So I'm going to just briefly introduce um, each artist in the order in which they'll be speaking. And and yes, we, we've talked about the time limits, and so we'll, we'll try to be careful about time. Uh, so far, if any of you are new to the conference, so far we have looked at um, a definition of conflict, we have looked at human rights and recovery, uh, we have looked at theater in the midst of conflict, in the midst of violent conflict and conflict under repression. Um, and now we are starting to look at rebuilding a society after conflict. Um, our first speaker will be Maria Tragacci, and she is accompanied by Bogdan Georgescu. They are from Romania. Um, they are with the Generosity Offensive Initiative. Um, beginning in 2006, the Generosity Initiative brought together volunteers artists and artistic groups and non-government organizations to develop intervention programs um, in specific communities in Romania. So we look forward to hearing from them. Um, our second speaker is Dale Byam. She is at Brooklyn College, um, USA, and her specific focus and her interest is in theater for development in Kenya. Next we have Adelette. Ratha Garmiani, and um, he is an artist and curator who works in both the UK and Iraq. <laughs> He's the director of Art Roll, an organization dedicated to building a cultural bridge between the Middle East and the international community. Um, next we have Zane Lucas from Zimbabwe. Um, he is with Theory X Media which is a multimedia company. Um, it's been in existence for about six years, and he is head of the theater area of that company. Um, and their, their main purpose is to provide actor training for young artists in Zimbabwe. And right next to me is Lillian Mansour, um, who um, operates the Cuba Latina Theater Archive. And she is actively involved in developing U.S.-Cuba cultural dialogues through theater and performance. So that's a brief overview of our panelists. Their full bios are out there if you want to see them or you can find them online. So I'm not going to talk anymore, but I'm going to turn it over to Maria. Thank you. So I'm Maria uh, from uh, Romania, and I'm here representing the Generosity Offensive Initiative, and I'll stick on my papers in order, in order to deal with the time problem. Uh, in 2006, the Generosity Offensive Initiative arrived in Lahuva Orangu's neighborhood for making a documentary. It was then the first time people were speaking about the eviction process. Soon they realized, working together with us, that they have to act as a community towards solving their common problem. We started by organizing together with the community public debates in which the artists become, became the mediators between the people and the local authority. Practicing expression forms of participatory democracy like the public debate. Uh, sorry. Sorry, yeah. I need to ask her to talk a little bit louder. Yeah. Excuse me. So practicing uh, expression forms of participatory democracy, like the public debates, help them in building a conscious identity of the area and community, simultaneously recording its special recent and not so recent history. We aim to actively involve every citizen of Rahova Uranus community to register, expose and debate the social issues of the area. 
Only by reaching these means of expressions within the, pub the public debates, people might actively take part in the community self-representation and in the reforming of administrative, administrative and legal system according to their everyday needs. They are the day-to-day -day experts and the public administration should be consulting them on a regular basis. In 2007, the first evicted families from Rahova Uranus uh, threatened the local authority to put themselves on fire. The mayor, for the first time present into the area, came up with a temporary solution only for those family, families. The rest of the community still remained unprotected by any long-term social strategy. Our aim is also to contribute to the articulation of property restoration claims on behalf of the community that is still in danger of eviction ever since the plans, the plans for the area's further gentrification are officially confirmed. Thus, discussing their problems and acquiring democratic ways of expression in public debates, organized within the speaker corner example, uh, people whose voices are otherwise rarely heard in uh, the public arena did not receive any answer from the local authority. Even today, it does not feel any obligation or urgency to support and work upon their suggestions. In parallel with this social reality, the first creative educational community uh, workshops for the community children started. Music was the artistic expression generated by the community's identity that brought together the children and well-known jazz mu musicians from Bucharest. Together, they've created a local music formula, Biluna Jam Session. And here, if you can louder, uh, you can listen their live music associated. Soon the community got involved within the initiative. They opened the doors of La Bomba, this space that is running now on the screen. Uh, the former disco in the neighborhood for the artists and together transformed it into a community base, the first reconversion and the only yet venue into a cultural community center in post-revolutionary Romania. Through the community needs and actions, La Bomba society has, uh, has took steps ahead uh, the local authorities' mentality. The place gathers uh, within a common interest the Rahu Baurano suburban class, food sellers for the flower market, threatened by expropriation from their neighborhood, and the creative community for, uh, formed by artists and cultural activists involved in the Generosity Offensive Initiative. The neighbors and the artists built together the long-term community project La Bomba Rahu Baurano's community base. We continued the public debate, speaking louder and in a much more articulated form about the eviction process, uh, but still the local authority is not taking action towards Rahova Uranus community. We expected the local and the national authorities to support the example of cultural reconvention and to disseminate it. After four years of constant work, without any support from the authorities, we created our local formula of a community center based on voluntary actions on behalf of the artists and on the material community support as an administrative base. Following Biluna Jam session in 2010, the community proposed a new artistic formula to reinforce the eviction conflicted situation, and that was what you are seeing now, the Evicted Women Fashion Parade. The working method of La Bomba is the active art concept meaning arts in education and manufacturing focused on creating active citizenship. The revalorization of human resource and the creative potential of Rahova Uranus community have created around La Bomba a new aesthetic. Together we launched a new art concept, Active Art, through which participatory democracy means <coughs> of expressions are practiced. Um, the method used is going between university professional sets of values and the community creative potential, trying to find out new co-intelligent ways of active citizenship. Active art provokes experiences by gathering people in a positive attitude towards their challenges and force them after into action. The active art product has to build the collective memory and the community identity through the working process and the documentation of each new experience. 
the working process is both, both a social one and the process of valorization of the community's collective imaginary and its value stands in the artistic final product. And thank you, Bob Dan. and now I'm going to talk more specifically on the theater component. Maria and I started this for five years ago, I think it's now already. Um, I moved on from the um, Rahova community three years ago and I started doing projects um, in the country and the pictures you're going to see are pictures from uh, the most recent, um, one of the most recent projects I did in uh, in a maximum security prison in Romania. Um, and all this started in March 2004 when um, Roberta Levito came to Romania as a senior Fulbright specialist and coordinated a workshop called How to Write Something New. Um, that was um, the first time when I heard, and a lot of people that were involved in that workshop actually heard about what it's called a personal voice and ways to get to your deep, true personal voice and ways to express that. It was an, um, a month and a half of ama amazing meetings and working sessions, but still I personally felt that we need much more time to spend with her to really be able to put in practice all the amazing things most of the participants in that workshop were discovering for the first time. Um, actually, the first master's program in Romania on playwriting started um, a, a year after um, Roberta's workshops in Romania and um, it was the professor, uh, our professor that participated in that workshops that started after those workshops the, the, masters, the master's program, the first master's program in playwriting in Romania. So I guess we can clap our hands for Roberta. <laughs> So Roberta came back and we had two more work playwriting workshops and the final one, I mean not the final one, but the last one we did so far was called Training Trainers because she realized we got to the point that there, there were problems with the language bar, um, a language um, bar, uh, border, but like, yeah. and they, yeah, it's, <laughs> sorry, and um, the, la the last workshop we did together with her was training people to do actually playwriting workshops. And there's also another really important person I want to mention. Um, her name is Paula Donnelly, and she's the director of the Cornerstone Theatre Institute in California. And I was a student uh, at the Cornerstone Institute in 2005. Um, I think it was their second institute. And then I went back in 2008 and I was a documentarist there and I learned a lot about what community-based theater is through my work with Cornerstone. And also to thank is Marcy Arlin from Immigrants Theater and Corina Chutel from the Romanian Cultural Institute who did, together with Roberta Levito, an amazing program uh, four years ago. Um, after the fall, New Romanian uh, Realities um, here in New York, together with uh, CUNY University, when uh, Romanian playwrights were introduced for the first time to an American audience after after revolution. Um, as I already said, the pictures you're seeing are from the maximum security prison in Craiova, um, involved, um, and in the projects there were involved three actors and five persons in prison. We did together a theater performance on a play I wrote based on their stories and improvisation um, and also in parallel uh, because there were a lot of people who wanted to get involved but because of 
it was impossible to involve more people. We, um, we did a TV series in the sense that they had an internal TV in the prison and we were presenting uh, exercises and theater techniques in communicating and relating in um, a short, like half hour uh, TV uh, show and we presented that so that the other pre uh, people in prison can do the exercises in their rooms. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's briefly, but um, actually I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about the projects I'm doing and um, specifically, but I want to talk more about the method we got to. And first, because um, as uh, Dr. Bar Barbara Love said, it's good to put it out there, so you're going to be my platform, but besides that, I would love to get feedback. So I'm going to read. Um, so going back to theater. I think that the only, the, uh, the only reason why theater still exists and keeps existing is because it's direct um, and immediate uh, way to, of getting people together, connect them and their energies and make one present um, in a, a more real, a real way than any other art. To have theater, you have to have conflict. That's not negotiable. But the main thing that's not negotiable, for me at least, is the continuous and sustained aim in searching and revealing the truth. Truth, the supreme goal, has two major components, the good and the beauty. The two components are both equal, important and desirable in order to reach the truth. So you're, um, as, as a mission, um, uh, as an artist. And with that, the social change would come, the peace and tranquility and the harmony most people look for. Um, all the learning experiences I had during the last five years, either from amazing professionals or from amazing community members involved in the projects we did, got me to the point that, um, to start shaping a method of doing theater with and for communities. Active art is the process of revealing the truth and the work of art each of us, uh, inside each of us and transforming transform the everyday life into a collective work of art. And I really mean that, and I really think it's possible, and it's not just a metaphor. And I think there can be shaped out, and we can all come with ideas of how can we really do this. The concept of active art in theater is the direct and mediated form of representation of the reality. The active art theater, based on active art method, it's built specifically through the direct participation of the involved community in which the performance takes place. Um, the structure I will present, um, it's where I got so far and it's on working. On the good side, first and the most important is the documentation process and that's where it all starts. The documentation and the observation. I think we're first observationists, that's why I like to call it, and then artists and then facilitators. Learning, the most important thing, and the most important <coughs> resource we can offer to these communities that have no voice, that nobody pays attention to, and nobody cares about them. The documentation process is made through informal interviews, story circles, creative education workshops, public actions, and public debates. An essential component in the documentation of the artistic product um, um, is the element uh, uh, Essential is the um, um, documentation of the artistic product also, being the element that survives in time as a compression of the entire work process that's been made in the community. Still, the documentation process is a process that never ends while the artist is still part of that community. Second on the good would be the structure of the creative process and the working process. And I would say that it's important to imitate the creative processes of nature and not nature itself, in the sense that the way you structure the, pro the project, the elements you bring at the table, the permanent presence and total attention. But then, I am so sorry. The time's up. Okay. <laughs> Can we let him finish this sentence? Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll move to Dale. Okay. No, I, I'm just going to stop here. So, I am so sorry, thank you. Dale. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I have been asked to discuss or explore the issue of theater for development. 
um, and primarily within the realm of its uh, sustainability, but I'll explain very briefly what it means to me, or at least how it's been interpreted in various um, countries in Africa where I work in that particular discipline. Um, it actually began somewhat of an offshoot of an adult education project that emerged in Botswana in the 70s. And essentially, and it's still considered in that way, um, theater for development was in fact one element or one technique used to, um, to interpret or to develop a Freerian pedagogy in Africa. And it began, it began principally in, in a, through a project called Lights of Atnani in Botswana. Um, and it was commanded or engineered primarily by Canadian adult educators. And once they left, the project just dismantled. It, there was no, you know, it didn't sustain itself, primarily because a number of the techniques and the ideas behind it were imported, and it just didn't have the strength to sustain itself, though, to its credit, what it did was it identified the cultural resources within Botswana and used that as the foundation of the work. Um, however, outside of that, a lot of the techniques themselves were imported. Um, another major project then went, was I think happened in, in, in Kenya. And by far, I think this was the most successful project in that uh, what Ngugi what Yongo calls, it created the revolutionary idea for um, community or popular theater in Africa. But however, again, that project, though it, it used the cultural forms from the community and though it developed primarily alongside of the community, the community built its, built its literacy, literacy skills while also developing the project. That also meant to some untimely demise, primarily because there was another factor that needed to be considered, and that is um, the government support. And in the absence of the government support, anything can be silenced. Um, and so it was silenced. And so a number of those persons who were involved in that project, one principally, Gugiwa Mirier, then kind of moved to Zimbabwe in a, a form of a voluntary exile. Well, he really didn't have much choice because he had been detained in, um, in Kenya. And so he goes there and he builds this phenomenal movement, which is um, called the Zimbabwe Association for Community Theater. And that lasts for approximately 10 years. And that, on the other hand, is supported by government. But as the government changes, um, it is also supported by donor agencies. And as, of course, I don't, most of you know to some extent, um, the dynamics of Zimbabwe and the relationship between the West and Mugabe and Mugabe's transition from a seemingly revolutionary leader to a despot. And that in turn leads to the demise of most of the theater for development projects in Zimbabwe because though in some ways it still maintains the government support, it lacks the donor agency support. So those are three major models of theater for development. Um, one that has, however, sustained itself over time has been Tostan from Senegal. And one of the reasons why it has maintained, uh, sustained itself over time is because, number one, number one, um, it, 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 Senegal is a relatively stable country, politically. And of course, it is the, the, the engineers of the, or the, the people who, who uh, commandeered the project um, were wise enough to engage the community much in the way that Zimbabwe and Kenya had done. So even as it is, exists right now, it is still a very sustainable project. But when we think about acts of violence, and this is what is problematic about the discussion altogether, is that we're looking at this as though it's in the aftermath of something. And when we think about the acts of violence, particularly on the African continent, we have to think about slavery, we have to think about colonialism, we have to think about neo-colonialism, we have to think about um, perceptions of Africa, we have to think about the marginalization of Africa, we have to think about us in bringing our techniques to Africa as though Africa has no techniques of its own. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, so we think about our theater in a liberating way, but sometimes it finds itself domesticated. And in the course of domesticating, it can sustain itself. Um, 
I think one of the most interesting things that came out of the panel, uh, one of the discussions, much earlier discussions, the, on the opening day, the UNDP representative actually, um, at the beginning of his discussion, said that he was not familiar with the role that theater had had in development. And then further on, he talked about a number of projects that they had funded. And then, so one of the problems in terms of development is how the world perceives theater and culture and its role in development. And so there are a number of issues that must be sort of tweaked out for us to, um, to really, you know, discuss the subject in tremendous detail. So I want to discuss some issues that I think um, might be useful in sustaining uh, theater for development projects in Africa. And one is, and in, in the various countries of Africa, is acknowledging that Africa has its own cultural forms. Okay, one of the problems is we are always so dead bent on taking some technique to Africa. <laughs> I don't know what that's all about, but Africa's <laughs> had forms from the get go. Um, in fact, it's debatable now as to when theater begins in Africa. People talking about the origins of theater in Greece and Finnegan and others, ethnographers talking about Africa and its quasi theater forms, quasi theater forms because it lacks linguistic interpretation or all of these different things that someone has determined must be theater. So I think principally one of the things that we have to understand is that Africa has its place in the world and Africa has been a teacher to everyone else. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, it's problematic first of all to think of it in that way. So I think we have to acknowledge culture as an integral part of development and in acknowledging culture is to recognize that the continent itself has its cultural forms, its masquerades, its festivals, and all of those elements that can inform development that in some way are dismissed um, and everyone you know, is wearing this badge of going to Africa and taking some technique that doesn't sustain itself. Um, and so I think that's one thing. Um, I think there also needs to be a mutual understanding and a dialogue with, uh, when I say mutual understanding and a dialogue, Oftentimes, particularly when theater for development is, is directed towards AIDS, develop, um, AIDS awareness, even as animators coming from the outside, we don't share our experiences of AIDS in America. We go there with this idea that we're going to solve someone else's problem, but no one says, you know, these are the people that I know, these are the issues that confront my community, this is how poverty has affected AIDS in, in my area, in my community. There's no discussion about that. So that also becomes an issue that I think needs to be entertained in considering issues of sustainability. Um, the other thing is that to consider, and I think this is connected to the very first point that I made, to consider the strategies that are connected to the community. And that requires an investment. And oftentimes, we do these two-week, three-week um, approaches to Africa. We visit, and we do a workshop here and a workshop there. And we think in some way that that's in empowering people. Uh, I witnessed, for one, when I was in Ghana, work that was done from, through a theater for development organization. And um, they were doing theater for development in the communities. Uh, they ignored most of the Akan cultural forms that they were familiar with and went in there to do forum theater in the marketplace. And what I thought was intriguing about this was that it was confined to a very small number of people. So the considerations, the cultural considerations about who engages in dialogue, how we engage in dialogue, was totally not considered. It was just almost the importation, much in the same way that colonialism had imported its structures into Africa and sort of, you know, negated all of the other structures. Sometimes the very liberation philosophies that we advance can be domesticating. So um, I think that that is one of the ways in which um, our intentions, though honorable, must be fully considered when we begin to explore the subject of sustainability elsewhere. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Adelaide. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, 
uh, good afternoon. Uh, what a, a great pleasure to be in here in the United States. And uh, thank you ever so much for Theatre Without Border to make this happen. It has been a few days extraordinary, amazing. Uh, right, I'm going to talk about myself, a bit to choose who I am, and then I'm going to talk about my project and the work I have done uh, between UK, United States, and Iraq. But before, I'm going to do a little performing for one minute, and then I will get back to you. First year, the primary school was the first year of war between Iraq and Iran. Mm -hmm. So I left the war until 1988. I experienced all this, uh, you might all know what a war can bring to any country, any society. And then uh, in 1998, the war is ended, and uh, Saddam Hussein gives uh, his victory, and then the brutal start with punishing on his um, citizen across Iraq. Um, according to myself, I'm a Kurdish from Iraq. So an operation of Anfal, uh, mm. which is 182,000 Kurdish people executed, mm. while I lost 90% of my family. Mm. And then I experienced mm. before prison and other stuff. I'm not going to go for the detail. Um, not long, in 1990 to 1991, as you know, the first Gulf War started, which is the devastation began for all structure for Iraqi society and then for the neighborhood as well. So it was a tough time. Um, it was a very, very tough time. We escaped to Iran. We, you know, from the from the army, and then uh, I was a student at um, uh, Institute of Fine Art in the city of Mosul uh, before the war. Then I couldn't go back there uh, because what we have in the city is completely destroyed. It so I finished my study in uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan, and it was a safe zone created by uh, UK, US, France, I think so, some other countries as well, to protect the Kurds from the Iraqi army. Um, yeah, I studied there and then I uh, practiced as an artist. I worked with the communities, uh, international uh, NGO, uh, local NGO, uh, to do with the human rights and being active regarding the situation in the country in general, until 1991. Um, I left Iraq, and then I have based in uh, in um, uh, UK. I studied there in art, and then I 
worked with the community as well. I um, uh, began to establish organizations called ArtRoll, which is the main objective of ArtRoll is to develop a cultural exchange between um, Middle East and the rest of the world. Uh, we are focusing in particularly between you know, um, Iraq, United Kingdom and United States. We have developed a number of uh, projects, especially after 2003. And in 2006 and 2007, while well, minimum 100 people lost their life every day in Iraq, we um, developed a number of projects. We managed to bring some Iraqi artists into the United Kingdom. We, take, um, we took a number of uh, Ira UK and um, US artists and academic into Iraq. I mean, Iraqi Kurdistan, the only area you can have access to it. Um, it was an extraordinary experience to bring the people together uh, and the idea is to establish a dialogue um, and, and to bring awareness and to be able to help the country. Um, throughout those number of projects we have done, specifically we um, done a post-war art and culture festival last year in November. It was the um, first um, uh, event in such a skill to be done. Um, and we have among the audience to Cynthia Schneider was our honorable um, VIP guest and she was part of our symposium panel. Uh, we had um, a masterpiece of artwork done by the British artist, by uh, American artist, as well as we developed a symposium. We invited curator from Tehran, Istanbul, Egypt, and then uh, from uh, Babylon University, southern of Iraq. We get uh, uh, from US, UK, and we, the idea is to create this um, uh, opportunity to discuss how to rebuild the country after the war in the country, which is always introduced through the media, as uh, just a place for the exclusion and killing and uh, sectarian. Uh, we managed to establish a discussion inside the country itself. Um, so I'm follow that number of other projects. My personal point of view about um, rebuilding the society um, it has to start, in my personal point of view, with the, with the individual, with the group, with the community. People living in chaos, people being through the very tough time, um, lifting crisis, especially that such a, a brutal war happened in Iraq. Any, any initial idea or project to approach those society in terms of rebuilding, it has to start from the people. Bring the confidence to those, to the individual, to the community. Because they don't believe anything. They live in chaos. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know how to start. So we start with the community. We start with the individual. And then thinking about what the society needs in terms of supplying water, electricity, you know, rebuilding a street and building, and et cetera, et cetera. So it could be anything, it could be start with the education, it could be start with the working with the youth, addressing a woman issue. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not easier, but it's the, um, I believe it's the first step. It has to bring the confidence back to the people to think they have, they, you know, they, because they, they think they're ignored, they believe they, they are isolated from the rest of the world. So you need to bring the confidence back and they feel they're part of the world community. And they, you know, and then we can do that. And the help, and they can't do it alone. So they need the help from us. When I say from us, and I speak as a British, you know. Um, <laughs> if I mean from the West, and especially American and uh, uh, UK, who lead the war to Iraq, um, there is a plenty of responsibility and plenty of area and opportunity to do to do so. And thank you so much. Thank you. Zane, you can relax for a minute. We're going to have just a, a brief detour, um, and I apologize from the bottom of my heart for cutting you off, Bob Dan, and we would like for you to be able to finish your presentation. Um, if I... No, it's okay. I, I mean, um, I didn't realize um, it's going to take longer than seven minutes and a half, but so it's my problem. I didn't <laughs> compress it. Uh, I'm just going to sum it up. and. Um, I, I was feeling this before coming here, but now after hearing all these people and uh, seeing all these people from all over the world, I really got to the uh, strong uh, position that um, these people, like artists that do this kind of work and do this, have this kind of uh, involvement, 
um, in order to move forward, I, I heard somebody, but I, I can't tell who was saying something outside yesterday, like, we don't have to accept this tolerated position and be like, oh, we're somebody but a big theater we, and we have nothing to do with it. And I think that's because um, of the organization and of the um, structure uh, and the professionalism uh, of the artists, in the sense that the artists working in this kind of uh, communities and situation and problems uh, are pretty much the same as surgeons, uh, sur surgeon, mm -hmm. sur surgeons, in the sense that um, there is a problem, and there was a lot of talking about healing. Like, who would want to be, uh, who who would want to get a, a a surgery from somebody who has a vague impression of what it is, or <laughs> who doesn't really know exactly. Um, what the problems are, or who you are, but <laughs> exactly, and I think that's, that's the, the most important thing, it's like the professionalization of the artists working in this kind of, of uh, in this kind of theater, and I'm not talking um, about aesthetics only, but also it's the artist's responsibility to get each community to its um, aesthetic and theatricality and not in the sense of putting out their uh, traditional costumes and traditional something and like really discover what's the aesthetic of that community in 2010 in this context and in, in this uh, messed up world that we live in. It's not, we didn't meet here to uh, get to all on the pay, uh, or to the same, uh, to agree together that we live in a messed up world. I think we all know that. Mm -hmm. But like, how can we really do something? Like how, and really exchange instruments. Like, I think that the specific stories should be just tools in order to um, uh, argument the, 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 the instruments we're proposing. And I'm, I'm really hoping to get either in, in former or former to talk more about this kind of, of tools because that and like really connect and really have this chance like this conference the chance to really get ourselves together and get organized to really make a difference because otherwise it's just these big words of how amazing and wonderful our work is but still there's war, people dying and all the hate that's going on right now. Thank you. Zane. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, when uh, Daniel first asked me to, um, if I would be interested in coming to this conference, he asked me if I could sit on the conflict under repression panel. And I looked at it and I went, repression? We still under repression? No way. Um, and I was quite relieved when he, he emailed back and said, would you rather um, sit on the rebuilding society after violent conflict? And I thought, well, that's much better. <laughs> oh, gosh, you know, we, we, have a, we have a new government. Of course we're rebuilding society. And last week, um, our censorship laws changed again, making it much more difficult to do anything on stage. And so I thought, oh. Okay, <laughs> maybe I should have been on the other panel. <laughs> but who knows, you know, I could get back next week and things could have changed. Um, I think certainly for me, um, Zimbabwe and, and the art scene in Zimbabwe is a bit like, uh, for anyone who's been to England or knows the weather in England, it's a bit like the weather in England. You can go through four seasons in one day in England. And certainly the same in Zimbabwe. You can go through what seems like absolute peace and calm, and the next day there's complete, complete chaos on the streets or the government has changed some law. Um, and certainly for the, um, the last 12 years that I've worked in theatre in Zimbabwe, that's, that's how I've seen things. When I um, uh, went back home after four years at university, the theatre scene was so vibrant. Um, there were many theatre companies um, 
the, the theatre in the community, um, as um, Dale uh, mentioned, um, theatre in the mainstream was huge. Um, I worked with a very successful theatre company um, in Zimbabwe, and we toured a lot, we did a lot of political satire, a lot of social um, commentary plays. Um, and then with, with everything that happened, you know, I kind of turned around one day and realised that most of the actors that I worked with had suddenly disappeared. They'd all kind of packed their bags and um, moved to New York and London and South Africa. And um, I turned to one of my colleagues and I said, well, what are we going to do? You know, theatre the theater is what I love doing, theatre is my life. What are we going to do about this? And so we decided to look into the communities um, to find young actors who perhaps didn't have the money to go to university in, um, out of Zimbabwe or even within Zimbabwe, but who had a unique talent, who were, um, had a passion for performing. And so we started um, the, what's called the Theory X Theatre Theater Initiative. And we take on five actors every year, and we work with them for three years, um, in the, giving them skills within performance, um, which, which is our main, our main focus. Um, but also um, giving them skills to go back into the communities um, and work with the communities that they've come from, um, giving them the, um, the talents to head their own projects. So, for example, um, one of our actors runs a radio project um, that is catered towards kids, um, and we use the, um, the child, um, uh, Children's Rights Charter um, as a, a basis for, for this radio program. We also um, encourage them to take part in uh, national road shows where they go into rural communities and um, perform little playlists based on, on things that are affecting the community. So whether it's uh, gender violence or safe migration or um, good sanitation. Um, one of our, our key uh, projects is in uh, collaboration with a Belgian organization called Volens. And um, our actors work with orphans and vulnerable children. Um, and at the moment we work with four organizations. Um, and it's kids aged from six to um, teenagers um, who are 19. Um, and with the younger kids, uh, what they do is they, they use uh, puppetry as a means of ex um, to get, getting the kids to express themselves. Um, it starts off with the, the actors presenting a little puppet show. And over a six week period, they work with the kids and with, um, with the, care, the carers at, at these centers. Um, teaching them how to, firstly, to make the puppets, and then how to tell stories, and then presenting these stories. Um, with the older kids, um, we use poetry. Um, again, giving them the skills of, you know, the, of how poetry um, is structured, um, and then getting them to write their own poems. Um, over the last two years, what we've done is we've taken these, um, these organizations into a, a festival, um, that is usually um, for you know, school kids who, you know, what we call the former grade A schools in, in Zimbabwe and Harare. Um, and so it's quite a, a unique experience to bring um, these kids who um, live in um, orphanages or um, who are part of a street kid scheme into, um, the, into um, a community of, of children who've been educated from day one. Um, and they you know, they perform together on, on this national stage, um, which is rewarding for, for, both, for both parties. Um, the other um, project that I, I um, facilitate and work on is with the Harare International Festival of the, Ar Festival of the Arts. And that is a new playwriting program called Hyper Direct, um, which encourages new, young Zimbabwean writers to come forth and, and tell their stories in whatever form. Um, and they are then paired with directors and these plays are produced every single year. Um, over the last five years we've had um, 20 great plays come out of it. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see a play about a young black homosexual man and his um, government-employed brother, for example. <laughs> Um, last year we had um, 
the first play of its kind of, of you know, play that dealt with the farm invasions that happened mm -hmm. um, in Zimbabwe. And this year, uh, one of the interesting pieces uh, was called Election Day, um, that um, uh, deals with a rather old, old leader um, and his um, fairly young wife um, on Election Day, um, and his uh, refusal to leave the State House because he knows that even though at the moment the opposition is winning by two million votes, he's bound to remain <laughs> as the president, um, which is of course what happens. Interestingly, um, <laughs> that piece was meant to be performed this week in, in Bulawayo, in the second city in Zimbabwe, and had to be pulled because the censorship board um, said it was not fit to be put on the stage. Um, so, yes, we're building, but still under some sort of repression. Um, but um, I hope to get there someday. I hope that one day we can um, kind of say, yes, we are truly rebuilding and um, can get past um, the, the difficulties that, um, that we've had to face as Zimbabweans. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lillian. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Daniel and, and Roberta, for uh, inviting me. And um, I would say that uh, I mean I, I come from a zone that's uh, really of low intensity conflict, which is in a way incomparable to the kinds of experiences that, that, that have been shared here. But nevertheless, I mean, a zone that has left very deep scars, um, and it's those scars that we're trying uh, to kind of address and heal through uh, theater. Um, so I am uh, speaking from the Miami Havana uh, border zone. This is a, a very real, but also conceptual uh, space in which acts of real violence and symbolic violence have been uh, perpetrated for the last 50 some years. Um, and in the case of Miami, I'm speaking about um, whenever uh, Cuban performers from the island come, well, when we are able to get the Cuban uh, performers to come, um, bomb threats, um, uh, protests uh, with very loud uh, speakers that uh, are kind of in the back of the performances, etc. And um, in Havana, there are I mean, plenty of acts of symbolic violence uh, that uh, have been perpetrated. And um, neither uh, of those two communities have ever really kind of addressed and sat down and kind of talk about the wounds uh, that the, these again, 50 years uh, have left. Um, um, also, we're uh, working with, I mean, both uh, in, I mean, in the U.S., but Miami specifically, and Havana, working with um, a U.S. foreign policy uh, towards Cuba that is completely anachronistic. Um, as uh, many of you know, to go to Cuba, uh, I mean, it's forbidden for U.S. citizens to go to Cuba, um, and uh, in order for us to go for any kind of cultural mission, you need a special license. Um, that it's, uh, well, has been it's changing uh, the last uh, six months, luckily. Um, but, I mean, it's very difficult to get, and by the same token, to get Cuban artists to come to the U.S. Um, for the last eight years, it was, I mean, practically uh, impossible. Um, and, of course, all of these sanctions um, have been, I mean, in place since 1961. Um, in some years, I guess, uh, depending on the presence that we lacked here in the U.S., some, uh, you know, four years are tighter, sometimes they're looser, but it's really back to 1961 when the embargo against Cuba uh, was uh, imposed, and um, it's, I mean, it's an, it's an anachronistic policy that continues, and it's a policy of isolation that uh, was created during the Cold War. As we know, the Cold War is supposed to have ended, um, but it really hasn't ended uh, recently in Cuba. 
um, it's really like the U.S. policy towards Cuba is like this relic of the Cold War <laughs> that is, I mean, just continues to be there. Um, and many ask, well, why is this policy still in place? Um, Gorbachev was uh, in Miami in 2003 for actually a conference in Cuba, um, and uh, he said um, that, uh, I mean, one of the reasons he said is he said, there's a huge emotional rejection from the Cuban community in South Florida. Um, and of course, I mean, it's the, the a Cuban community that, um, as we know, has um, um, uh, a very powerful lobby in Washington, D.C., and, um, I mean, we can do things with a lot of other countries that, um, you know, arguably have a, a, a worse, um, uh, worse examples of human right abuses, et cetera, and when we straight and do things with them, but not uh, with Cuba. But then again, um, I mean, it's after uh, listening to a lot of the presentations uh, these last two days, I mean, these are, I mean, emotional wounds and um, that kind of guide also uh, the, the Cuban politicians. Not that I'm using that as an excuse in any way, <laughs> but actually, <laughs> so at any rate, um, these, so this, you know, uh, policy of antagonism and isolation, of course, have had, I mean, a, a horrendous effect on real Cuban families that have been split for 50 years. It's been very difficult to go back and forth, to communicate um, to uh, during the Bush era. Um, you know, you had a dying uh, relative, a dying mother in, in Cuba, and you couldn't go uh, visit them. You had to ask for permission. Sometimes it would take three months. Um, and, um, and vice versa. I mean, it's, uh, Havana also has um, its own ways of uh, separating the family. Um, and so what I've been involved with since the 90s um, is, I mean, in theater projects that try to intervene in this politics of isolation and kind of use theater projects as uh, a politics of reconciliation that imagines a greater Cuba that is a Cuba that goes beyond the island and its diasporic communities and um, a, a Cuba that can encompass the cultural production of both. Um, and these are alternative projects um, that have theater at the forefront, um, but I mean, um, whose plays are not necessarily what one would call political plays in any ways, but it's the process um, of making these projects possible that are transformative both for the people involved and for the communities that, um, um, Oh, that, that are, I mean, each audience. Um, and I'm going to talk, um, if I have time, about three projects, um, I guess, very quickly. The first one is a monologue performance festival that was organized in Miami in 2001 by uh, a theater group called La Matiodora and uh, myself. And the press called it the 10 days that changed the cultural landscape of Miami because we brought 29 Cuban artists along with the Vice President for the National Council for the Performing Arts and um, nothing happened. Um, and so uh, and we kind of ironically say that the Miami Cuban Mafia, which is how we're called in Havana, kind of behaved itself. We no demonstrations, <laughs> you know, no bomb threats, it just went through. And it's kind of ironic because it's supposedly, it's like the largest delegation ever uh, to come to the U.S., to travel to the U.S. from Cuba. And um, this theater festival, I mean, regardless of the place that were presented, um, it was really important to look at its outcome um, at, I mean, in, at two levels. One is like the personal impact of uh, the people who participated and of some of the audience members, and of course its impact at uh, kind of the level of the public sphere. And um, I'm going to read a quote from uh, a personal uh, a piece in uh, and the opinion piece published in the Miami Herald by uh, Martha Barber, um, and I quote: "I realized how far we have come, and how, right under the eyes of both governments, the invisible barrier that has separated our communities for four decades is crumbling. Leave it to the arts to be the hammer that heals that that deals that fatal blow to this political conundrum. After ten days of kisses, embraces, and emotional te tears." What struck me most about this theater event is the banality of trying to keep our community split. 
end quote. Um, and uh, the festival, re uh, the festival received a lot of press coverage. Uh, we played to, I mean, sold out audiences. Like I said, there was no, um, you know, no protest whatsoever. And um, it really uh, moved all of the participants to kind of act and think differently about um, the others uh, in our midst. So it was an experience that changed the Cuban Americans um, to view their, uh, to change their opinions about their brothers on the island and, uh, and vice versa. And um, I mean, the, the, the festival was, um, and this is a, uh, what, you know, was telling a, a lot of, I mean, at the time I was saying, more than a display of faith, the festival was really an, a door that opened a lesson in civil tolerance and peaceful coexistence. Um, that festival um, gave, uh, gave us the opportunity to actually do a real uh, theatrical co-production between Miami and Havana. Um, the following year, um, five theater artists from Miami went and worked for three months with five artists from Havana. They lived together, rehearsed uh, under very difficult conditions, but the conditions that um, uh, all artists have uh, in Cuba and actually Miami. Uh, in many ways to make art. Um, I mean, it's a condition of theater artists, uh, uh, of alternative theater artists, I should say. And um, the play opened uh, in at the National Theater Festival, I mean, at the National Theater in Havana. It toured the island, and um, I mean, it was uh, really, uh, not just was it well received, but it really forced uh, the audience in Cuba to look at uh, the play in a way that has not really, had not really looked at or had not really been talked about, and it's really from the perspective of diaspora and of uh, kind of the split families and um, split, um, uh, I mean, the, the, the very emotional wounds that um, this political split has created. Um, and um, the third one is, I mean, very briefly, the Cuban Theater Digital Archive that I've been um, working with, and it's uh, a digital initiative that aims to, on the one hand, document Cuban theater wherever it's produced, but at the other, it has opened up a digital space for communication and exchange uh, between our, um, our two communities. Um, and um, I think I'll just leave it at that because my time is up. <laughs> Thank you all so much. One of the one of the things I've learned, one of the sort of mundane things I've learned from this conference in, a, in the midst of all the amazing, phenomenal, wonderful stories is that we need to allow these people a little more time to tell their stories. Um, I, it was said this morning um, that you know an hour might might be enough to give a brief overview, but you know in ten minutes they're like telling these great things. But so, but we do want there to be um, some sharing from the audience and you can find you can find everybody um, if you want to talk to them wandering around the conference at some point but um, please does anybody in the audience have a story you'd like to relate or something you'd like to share with one of the artists down here about using um, theater to rebuild society yeah. I just want to thank Adelette for his uh, performance at the beginning. I think we're sharing a lot of information here this week, and it's really um, great to have moments where we can just come from the heart and reflect back. And, uh, and especially since people are having so little time to tell their stories, it's important to have moments where we just go somewhere here. So thanks. Oops, oh, thank you. There are two people up at the top. I have a question um, for the uh, presenter on Africa around sustainability. You, you were talking about the importance of sustainability. Can you expand a little bit more about how you what you're thinking around that and how theatre has a role in that. Well, the theatre development projects are geared towards sustainability. 
that's in essence what they are. Because what they are, it's like, it's almost like the theater in itself, it doesn't operate independently. It works alongside of development agencies. So quite honestly, uh, quite honestly, there isn't this um, definitive cultural project. It's not defined so much as a cultural project as it is an aspect of an educational project. So that's why, you know, UN people, UNESCO people will still, I mean, I think up to two days ago, they were still ratifying, um, a, I think there was a proclamation relative to the importance of culture and development. And UNESCO is still grappling with that, I think up, up to September 22nd. They just met to confirm whether or not culture plays a significant role. So, I'm serious. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, it happened concurrently. It happened alongside of our, our, um, our so, so, what I'm saying is that it's not dealt with independently. So it works alongside of development agencies. And so development agencies are there, ostensibly to, for the purpose of sustainability, to extend development in, in, in the long term. Theater is just one vehicle that someone tapped into and they said, we'll try it, and then it works. And, you know, so the idea behind it is it hasn't worked, for the most part. It has worked in places where those who've invested in it fully, who are still there and who are committed to it, and who've tapped into the cultural forms there, um, it's, it's sustained itself there. But outside of that, either government oppression or what is it, um, you know, economic problems or politics of some form or the other has intercepted and just blocked its development. So that's really what I was referring to when I talk about the development side. It's, it's that it's supposed to be maintained over a period of time. It doesn't go away after three weeks. It's not a workshop. It's supposed to sustain itself. So I hope I'm making myself. Thank you. There's a, a man over here who's had his hand up for a while and two people behind him. Yes, thank you. Um, just to share, to share an experience, last year in, in Zimbabwe I did a direct play called MNZ. And um, at the end of the play, after the first day, um, there was the Minister of National Healing uh, in the audience. And so we talked and I asked her to, uh, what, what did she think about the play. She was happy with the play. And she said, you know why? Because, I mean, you tackle, because I really think that all theatre is always political. So you tackle all the political subjects of what is happening in, in Zimbabwe now, but with humour. And you have to remember something, that in Zimbabwe, and, and we have Zane here to confirm it, in Zimbabwe, even when we are tortured, we laugh in order not to lose our dignity. This lady was tortured almost to death two years before by Mugabe. Thank you. I think we maybe have time for two more, or one more. trauma awareness, working with trauma and understanding the deep and profound effect that it has on us physiologically and psychologically. And I just wonder as theater practitioners whether are you is this an area that, that, that is taken into account when you're working in conflict areas? Are you are you able is this an area that you have been an understanding of working with um, in performance and also with the audience. I'm just, I'm just trying to... Because there hasn't really been any mention about the suspension of time that happens in trauma and uh, the depth of, you know, what, what we're picking up is something that's so deeply frozen or immobilized or disassociated or hyperarousal and this in, in theater, is this actually taken into account when you're working? Okay, um, okay. What, well, 
Could you clarify, because I think you might want to answer that, yeah. but could you clarify even further? If he wants to know if when working in theater, um, is there any consideration about the target group, people that perhaps may have gone through some traumatic circumstance or event, and how is that handled? If you, when you're doing your work, if you're well, doing um, first, I want to thank to the um, um, Mr. in the back for the observation on humor, and I think it has to do with what I was calling the surgery, in sense of you need to have that distance, and you need to be, in a way, also cynical to really be able to do something in these kind of situations, otherwise it's way too much to be able to do something. and. Um, it was, I was about to talk in my presentation and to answer your question, um, I think that um, a great thing of uh, working, uh, using theater as a conflict negotiation area is this possibility, like what we're doing is fictionalize the real stories and the real, in the sense that you change and mix them and then you get like a, the performance becomes kind of like a neutral area where conflicts can really be negotiated directly, but at the same time, um, we all know that it's a theater performance, like we know that it's a convention, but actually uh, real conflicts are um, put out there and consumed and negotiated through theater performances, and that's what we mostly do and look for, and also create structures of the performance in its theatricality that gives the audience the possibility to really get involved in the performance itself. Thank you so much. We, our time is up and um, you can continue these conversations um, on your own. As, as Daniel always says, man, we wish we had Cadillacs and limousines and roses and champagne and diamonds, and, but we do have La Mama commemorative calendars and <laughs> and truly for 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 some of us um, who sort of came of age in the 60s, not that I would ever admit that. Um, Cafe La Mama and Ellen Stewart are really, I, I mean, I sort of feel like I've gone back to the theater of Dionysus and being in this space. So it's really an honor to be here. So I'm going to give you to Daniel, who knows everything. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you. And to the panel, please. Much appreciation to the panel. So I'm, I'm going to do an intervention for a second, because we've been going at the speed of light. So I just want to take a moment for us to take a collective breath. Well, in your own time, we don't have to do it as one. <laughs> <laughs> and also, if you'd like to take a collective sigh as well, you can let something out or shake a little bit, uh, release some of the trauma. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Susan. Uh, we, Deborah Simwe from Uganda was um, set to moderate this panel and at the last minute, very last minute, the day that the program went to press, uh, we found out she didn't get her visa in time. Yes. She didn't get her visa yet. yet. I said in time. I said in time. Yes. Yeah, I'm not saying she's not getting one, I'm just she didn't get it in time. So Susan jumped in and thank you Susan and, it, and I really appreciate it. It's hard to be thrown into something at the last minute and you were a trooper and I really appreciate that. Susan actually does amazing work in West Virginia at an HBC, and she has lots of stories to tell too, and is a fantastic practitioner and organizer and thinker, and so um, I relied on our previous relationship to say, hey, can you do this? So the, the other thing, yeah? I just say this, and, and what they get for throwing a newbie in a poor Bob band had to suffer the, um, the consequences. <laughs> And, 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 and I did want to say, I actually wanted to say that we, I wanted to say something about time. Because, yes, 10 minutes, five minutes, seven and a half minutes is not enough to share an entire life's work up to whatever point we are in our work. 
but we had a tremendous opportunity to have a lot of people be at this conference. And so I want to say that there's a balance sometimes with inclusion. And by creating space for lots of voices to be heard, it meant that there had to be fewer time. And so we're aware of that. We're painfully aware of that. We know you are painfully aware of that. We certainly heard this morning on my panel how painfully aware my panelists were of having to cram you know, a lot of traumatic experience into 10 minutes. And so I just want to say that it's not something that is unconscious on our part. It was a, it was a choice. Maybe in another iteration, we'd have three people on a panel and then more time to talk about things. But given that this is the first time that we've done anything of this size, and it's the only time that I know that anything exactly like this has ever happened with the kind of room that we have, which is very different than the way that these meetings often happen, that it was a, um, it was a creative choice to have as many people in the room as possible, knowing that conversations will go on outside. And, and the performances. So we have now Da that's waiting to come in here to do their tech so they can do their best for you tonight. So, you know, we understand we're artists. It's a, it's, it's so, so it, this is my way of thanking you for allowing us to be experimental and figure it out as we're going on. And we are taking note of all of the things that are working and all of the things that we will consider to do differently next time. And we thank you for your generosity.